Saturday morning, we call it Plus Sports Special on Plus TV Africa. My name is Wally Scott. Welcome on the show. Now, I'll talk to my guest later. He's coming through via Zoom. But um, somebody was joking with me a few weeks ago that the Lagos City Marathon is just a way for Nigeria to show how hospitable we are. We bring foreigners in. We open our hotels to them, our food. Then we let them run. Then they win. Then we give them money and they go back with our money. They always come and win our money. Ethiopians and Kenyans. Nigerians have never won the Mississippi Marathon. This is the sixth episode. Now it's, now it's silver labeled marathon. Nigeria has not won before. First, second, third, none. We just bring these guys in, Ethiopians, Kenyans, give them free food, hotel to sleep in. They come, they run, they win, they go with our money. Well, one just finished. Despite all the postponements, COVID-19 pandemic and all, we made it happen. We did it. Now, Emmanuel Naibe from Kenya is the winner of the 42-kilometer 2021 Access Bank Legacy City Marathon. He crossed the finish line in 2 hours, 11 minutes, and 37 seconds. Last year, Kenya's David Bamasasi Tumo won the Legacy City Marathon in 2 hours, 10 minutes, and 20 seconds. Now, the 42-kilometer race commenced from National Stadium in Sulere and finished at the Eco Atlantic. He will be leaving with a whooping $30,000, while the runners-up and second runners-up will bag $20,000 and $15,000. Now, Mesuret Dinke from Ethiopia, winner female category at the 2021 Access Bank Lagos City Marathon. Good morning, Victor Geoffrey. Good morning, Wally. Thank you for having me here. Victor is joining us via Zoom from Lagos. Good morning, Victor. Good morning. Can you hear me? I wish I could hear you well, but you're not speaking loud enough. Your audio, something is wrong with it. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, loud and clear. Okay. Now, Victor, fantastic. the city marathon just ended. And of course, a Kenyan and Ethiopian won male and female category. Do we just do this organized event for, for foreigners to come and win and go home? Yes, now. <laughs> seems, seems like that. <laughs> Seems like it. Well, the reality of the matter is that these these individuals that won this, this tournament are, you know, they are historically known for winning such tournaments. I mean, Ethiopia, Kenya, Eritrea, these are countries that have throughout the history of the Olympics and long distance running have done so well. So I am not too surprised. Uh, it's a marathon. Not I don't think it's really for us Lagosians or Nigerians. Let's just put it out there for the world. Whether we win it in the future, I don't know, but. The fact that a Kenyan or an Ethiopian won it, I'm not too surprised about it because that's what they normally do. It's like being surprised if Brazil does win in a tournament, in a football tournament. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Let's go straight to the track and field events of the ongoing National Sports Festival. It began on Friday at the Samuel Ogbemudia Stadium with Team Delta dominating the sprint events. Now, the state, however, only managed bronze medals in the women's 100 meters hurdles and men's 110 meters hurdles. Oluwakami Francis won the bronze medal behind Rivers, Grace, Ayimoba, and Miracle Thompson of Lagos won the gold and silver medals. In the men's event, Martins Ogirahi finished third with Lagos and Anambra athletes claiming gold and silver, with three athletes competing in different heats of the women's 100 meters for Delta State. It was victory for the state as look forward to the semifinals today. Praise Ofoku of Delta State won heat one. 11.67 seconds with Esse Brume, an elite athlete, winning Heat 4 in 11.69 seconds, while Heat 5 was won by another Delta athlete, Grace Nzubechi, in 11.46 seconds. Now, um, Victor, I'm coming straight yeah. to this, and I'm saying this without fear of favor. How can mm. Delta not do well when they have an Esse Brume, an elite athlete who was running different major competitions abroad, Come here, of course she will win. I thought the Lagos Festival was supposed to be a grooming ground for future athletes. How can you let Adesse Brume, who is a certified international athlete across the world, to come run against this young athlete? And you think she won't win? She will win gold, of course. Well, I'm not too surprised about it. Um, to be honest with you, like you mentioned, uh, it's, um, it is what it is. You can't, you can't for me, I think this should also be a chance for uh, athletes who are doing well in the diaspora to come back home and really have a tournament for themselves or a festival or a sporting competition for themselves because it will help encourage the younger ones or those who are home-based to really step up their game. It also gives the chance for the sports ministry and those organizing competitions to 
help our athletes who are based here in Nigeria get the better facilities, better training, better information, uh, you know, knowledge on how to become international level athletes. So I'm not too surprised that that was the case. Uh, I think it's more of, more of an incentive for us to step up our game here, especially in, in our sports in Nigeria. I mean, to be honest, it reminds us the fact that we've had, you know, the, the issues of, um, you know, uh, the COVID-19. The state of sports in Nigeria, really, to be honest with you, other sports, even apart from uh, even our major sports, which is football, has really been nothing to write home about. So I'm not too surprised about the fact that, you know, she won. And I mean, come on. Have it, you thought it is, about it is what it is? Have you thought about their mindset? Mindset in the sense that if I was a Jamaican and I was in a sports mm -hmm. festival in Jamaica and you tell me an mm -hmm. elite athlete like Usain Bolt was coming to run, you think I would run well? Let's look at their mindset now. Well, Do you think I would run well? But, but that's. I agree with that. See, I think what, what we need to now have to put in place is that it's not just about the mindset. Having the mentality of a champion is incredible for any athlete in the world. However, if you, for instance, if, you, if we both have to run a race, physically speaking, you might want to win that race, but you might not just do it because you don't have the capability or the training. It doesn't matter if you're saying both is going to be there or Maurice Green or any of the greatest you know, 100 meter athletes we've had in the past. It is about the ability of that athlete. And you know about this sport, you have to train for years to get to that level. So you can't really blame these guys for, in quotes, not having the same level of, uh, you know, or performing the same level with these international athletes. It's just the fact that they don't have what it takes. It's just what it is. You're not just good enough. Not because you don't want to win or you don't have the desire. It's not about mentality now. It's about just the, the, the reality of your ability at this level. Okay, let's go that to my next it. story right now. There are lots of tons of matches to be played in the English Premier League this weekend. Now, um, this is um, a very funny story to read. I'll read it first and then I'll come back to the track and then I'll, we'll talk about it. Now, Jurgen Klopp has urged his Liverpool players to put things right against Aston Villa in the Premier League on Saturday, having lost to the same opponents 7-2 in this season's reverse fixture. It was the first time since April 1963 that the club had conceded seven goals in a match in all competitions. And Klopp believes Dean Smith's ninth-placed side are strong contenders for the UEFA Europa League qualification. The Reds still harbour ambitions of a top-four finish and sit just three points behind West Ham, who occupy the final UEFA Champions League spot. After back-to-back -back wins in the Premier League for the first time since January, Liverpool are looking to snap a six-game Premier League losing streak at home, although the German is confident that his team will improve at Anfield. Okay, now let's look at... Um, um, Victor, let's look at this. Liverpool lost to this team, Aston Villa, 7-2. The worst defeat the they've yes. suffered since 1963. And he says he doesn't see that happening again today and not ever again. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, I don't know about not ever again, but I know that that's not going to happen today. That's for sure. Um, I think that was actually a, a preview of what we were to expect from Liverpool. Because when they lost that match, everybody thought, oh, it's just a blip in the radar. Liverpool will still bounce back. There are no fans in the stadium, all that whole stuff. But the reality of the matter is that Liverpool have suffered a burnout. They need to re-energize, re-strategize for next season. They will not lose 7 to today, that's for sure. But uh, they are playing against a very tricky Aston Villa side. Don't forget, they have players like Ross Barkley, Jack Grealish, uh, you know, uh, Oli Watkins. These are solid players. Even the goalkeeper, from, former goalkeeper from Arsenal, Martinez is in goal. So, I mean, they have some pretty good players at Villa. Uh, and you have to understand that Villa was also a team that was fighting for relegation last season. So, this, this year, they have so much incentive and drive to try and play, you know, in Europe, maybe in Europa League next year. And even if they are lucky, maybe even in Champions League, which I, I doubt. But uh, I don't think Liverpool will lose 7 2 today. But they would definitely win this match. It's very, it's very tough one, but they'll win the match. But I don't think now, it's despite the fact two. that you, we don't, we don't, we have a very a largely depleted Liverpool defense. We've got a burned mm -hmm. out Sergio Mane. We've got a burnt out um, Mo Salah. A burnt out Roberto Firmino. Well, a rejuvenated Diogo Jota. But can he do it alone up front? The the issue with Liverpool is. Um, because many fans will say, oh, they had Virgil van Dijk injured, Joe Gomez is out of it, and other host stuff. But the reality of the matter is that Joe Gomez and van Dijk are not Mo Salah, Mane, and Firmino. Firmino's Mali and Salah this season just haven't found their scoring boots. And that's a brutal honesty. Let's stop sugarcoating it. Those players haven't played to the levels that we know they can play. 
for Jota, he this is his first season. Maybe we don't even remember. Uh, you forget that it's his first season. So I think Jota can step up. But the reality is that with Liverpool's quality, with the mentality they have, the history, the pedigree, you don't. I mean, you expect them to really stand up and be counted, even if you go through tough times. Many teams have gone through that period. Many great teams have been defined by injuries and, and, and issues, but they still step up and showcase why they are you know, great teams. So I think it's time for us as football fans and analysts to stop trigger-quitting and giving Liverpool excuses. Let them step up and prove us wrong. And they have a chance to do that today. Jota will probably get a goal or two, I'm sure. But he'll get a goal. He'll be involved in today's matches, I'm sure. Okay, let's look at the next match. Um, Everton manager Carlo Ancelotti believes his side needs to be more ruthless if he has to have a shot at European football next season. The Colombian, James Rodriguez, returned to the score sheet. However, the team dropped points at home after conceding a late equaliser to Crystal Palace last time out. The Italian believes the quality Rodriguez brings to the team can be key for the European battle. Ancelotti also added that he fully supports teams who have decided to boycott social media following the continued abuse aimed towards players. Ah, the, the biggest lesson is we, when we had uh, the possibility to kill the game, you have to kill the game because in football until the last second you never know what's going to happen. Unfortunately, uh, we considered a goal in the last period where we were not used to do and uh, we have to accept the result and to keep also the performance that was much better and uh, from the past compared to the past games and uh, try to win the next game it it is a big fight for the european position we are we are there we could do better yes i think at home we could do much better but we have to say that we had the fantastic run away and this is the reason because we are in the fight now. But th th this season said that when James Rodriguez is there fit, we have more possibility in front. We have, we have more opportunity because he has, as a lot of time we said, a lot of quality in front, uh, key passes, final passes, final shot. And, and so all the time that he was there fit, uh, we had uh, more opportunity. It, it is uh, absolutely normal. We signed him for this reason, to have more opportunity in front. Talking about, about James again, um, how... But why you, you talk all the time about James? Why? Because tell me why. My region, <laughs> you know, I will tell you why, because my region is always interested in James. <laughs> the Colombian, I know. at the moment, one I... of the most representative players around the world, and I am based here in England, following James. Anyway, I know, but, I know. Um, yeah, but, but talking talking about him and, and his turn up again to the to the squad uh, after the game, did you find him properly recover, or we have to be still worry about little things that can take him out from next game, so he's completely recovered? No, no, he, he has. He, 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 he has completely recovered. He is a player that. Playing uh, improve his condition. Uh, I think we have to take care for the f to, for him to recover well after games. But he recovered uh, properly. His condition is good. He's motivated, and uh, uh, he showed this really well in the game. Not because he scored, but because he was involved in play in the game against Crystal Palace. Uh, can you give us an update on Andre Gomez, who came off against Crystal Palace? You said it, you thought it was a, a, a hamstring problem, a small problem? Yeah, it is a small so, problem. Uh, it, it's too early to, to, to say which player will be available for, uh, for Monday, but for sure Andre Gomez, that he start to train individually today, will not be able to play on Monday and he will be able for the next game against Tottenham. We are checking Alan also that uh, he's train, he, he trained uh, normally this morning, but we have three days and we, uh, and to see how uh, it goes. Maybe he can be available, will be available Ivobi that was not available for the game against Crystal Palace and for the Jordan Pickford started training today uh, this week, but uh, 
I think it's not 100% that we don't want to take a risk for this game. And, uh, uh, and Delph uh, and uh, Bernard are uh, uh, following their, their individual program. We will play again. Uh, Ducouré had the scan uh, uh, last week. Everything was OK. Um, he is going to have a next scan in three weeks. And then he can start to, if uh, the, the, scan, yeah. is, the scan will be OK, in three weeks he can start to train. I think that I fully support this, uh, and I think every one of us fully support the, the fight against racism, against online abuses, and so I'm not the right person to... Now, Victor, Carlo Ancelotti, fantastic coach if you ask me. But um, he spoke extensively about the man whose name is spelt James, but is pronounced Amis Rodriguez. He speaks, the man came from Real Madrid and is doing perfectly well in Everton. But he says his side must be more ruthless in the remaining matches. Uh, that, is, um, that is expected from a coach of the level and you know, quality and pedigree of Ancelotti. Obviously, he has coached fantastic great teams in the past, the likes of, um, you know, um, uh, yes, coach likes of AC Milan, coach likes of PSG, Bayern, Real Madrid. So this is a coach that has so, so, many, so many years of experience. Uh, when you talk about ruthlessness in front of the goal of his, for his team, you have to be honest with Everton. Ever since Lukaku left, they haven't really had a proper number nine, a ruthless striker that has an instinct for goals. Yes, this the new guy Carlos Lewin is really trying his best. To be honest, this is his first season where he has been very prolific. And of course, that has earned him a call up to the national team for the English national team. Uh, but um, as uh, Everton really lack a proper striker with that cutting edge instinct that can finish off, you know, half chances. They don't have that, unfortunately. Um, and if you even look across the Everton attacking lineup, apart from Richarlison, Hamish Rodriguez, Alex Wobi, to an extent, Sigurdsson, they don't really have players that you can say, okay, these guys can pull up a magical moment like a Salah. Or, you know, or top players like Ronaldo and or Messi. And they don't have that. So I think collectively as a unit, they need to put more emphasis into finishing up games. Because watch Everton this season, there are many matches that if they have scored two or three more goals, they will have won. But they will drop points or even lose those games. And they need to be more ruthless if you want to really progress in this league known as the Premier League. I'll come to that, um, Victor. Before I, I, I get to the nitty-gritty of the show, on the show, um, just coming in, Nabei becomes the first Kenyan to win the Lagos City Marathon in the men's category. And of course, second and third are Ethiopian, Daressa Gileta and Demiso Legese. They are both Ethiopian, so male events. Um, a Kenyan comes first, second and third Ethiopian. And of course, um, in the female category, um, we've got um, Dinke winning, Mesela to Dinke. And of course, um, she's got um, Celestine Chepurichir from Kenya second and another Ethiopian, De Negesit Mulune from Ethiopia third. So male and female, first to third, is all Kenya Ethiopian. Okay. Now, um, Victor, quickly, um, before we go to our next story, um, what would you predict for Everton today in the English Premier League? Uh, well, Everton actually are, are not playing today. They're actually playing on Monday. Yeah. But if I'm going to predict, I would say that uh, they should they should get all three points. Um, uh, oh, okay, so the, 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 the tricky thing about Everton is because is the thing is you know they are not a team that you predict to win every match, but they're also not a team that you predict that they will lose every match. They're just those mid-table, consistent mid-table teams that win some days and win you know, and lose some other days. But moving forward, I think they are going to win uh, their game on Monday. Come Monday. I think they're going, to do, they're going to do their best win the game on Monday. I, I okay. Now, Brandon Rogers insisted that Leicester is the perfect place for him after Gary Neville tipped the Foxes boss as a future England manager. The 48-year-old, who's on the cusp of leading his side to UEFA Champions League football, explained that an international gig is something for later in his career. Rogers praised Gareth Southgate's work with the Three Lions and backed him to oversee the team's exciting generation of talent. The Leicester manager also clarified that Kelechi Nacho's new contract isn't necessarily about preparing for life after Jimmy Vardy, who hasn't scored in nine games in all competitions. Now, West Ham are the Foxes' next challengers 
in the Premier League on Sunday. Um, Gary Neville has been talking, as he as he tends to do, uh, and he thinks you should be the next England manager. What do you make of that? Oh, Gary. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, there we go. I, um, listen, listen, I, I want to manage international level at, at some point in my career, and it's, I've always, I think I've always said that. Uh, yeah, for me, but I, I'm very, very happy here. I've signed a, uh, a long contract here, and um, I've only been here just over a couple of years. So, uh, so for me, being at, at Leicester City is, is the absolutely perfect place for me. I can develop players. Uh, I've got great relations with the with the board and the hierarchy here, and uh, and I still feel there's still a lot of improvements we can make. So, uh, so yeah. But listen, Gareth in that job, he, he's done a great job since he's been there with him and his staff. England have an exciting generation of players, not only the ones now, but for over the next decade or so, from which we can see. So, uh, so they're always going to be competitive around it. But um, but yeah, I, I look. No further than where I am at the moment, of which uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very privileged to be here, Leicester. It, it speaks volumes, though. If it, was, if it was suggested kind of unilaterally, maybe. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I'd obviously that would always be a a club decision, but uh, but yeah, I think the social media side of things. I'm not. I've always said I, I'm. I can't really openly speak too much on that. Uh, because I, I'm not on any form of, of social media, so uh, so I don't know. But I, I certainly sense enough around the um, the challenges that are there, and um, and and that sort of, you know the, the psychological abuse that, that people receive within that. So uh, so yeah, if that's something that supports um, that this form of abuse, then of course it's uh, it's something that we and and I would certainly. Uh, be an advocate of for sure. Uh, you and Leicester are now convinced that he's the long-term successor to Jamie Vardy. No, what what we're saying is we think he's going to be a very important striker for us uh, in the future. But you need more than one. Um, that's for sure. I think he's uh, he's shown in the couple of years certainly that I've been here that uh, he's developing, he's improving. And he's going to be a very, very important part of the squad. Uh, but there's no doubt later on down the line, once Jamie is finished and moved on, we, we have to, uh, we would have to have another one, maybe two. So, um, so yeah, any any top club will want to have more than one, and uh, and that would always be the case. But what's great, we we Kells is we've seen his development, we've seen his improvement, seen his confidence grow, um, and. As you see him now playing, he looks a real threat and uh, he looks like he can score goals. So, uh, and being so young, we know there's a lot more to come. Um, can you update us on that David Moyes has created for the team? Well, first, I think he's uh, David's done a great job in, um, he obviously came in through, throughout the season last season. So, he's having to find out about the players again and some new players. Um, We've had a pre-season short, but had the chance to work with him, know exactly what it is he wants, and then been able to bring players in. And uh, he's moulded them into a very tough team to beat, very organised. Uh, so his organisational skills, his his experience and quality as a manager, uh, first and foremost. And then always alongside that, you need good players. And, uh, and they've got some outstanding players. It's unfortunate that Declan is out because he's... Uh, He's a top-class player, um, but you look throughout the team, you know, from the goalkeeper Fabianski, good, good experience of the level. Um, the defenders are strong; they defend well. Cresswell's got quality. Um, so far on the side, he's been great since he's come in. Um, and then, like I say, you get the experience and the qualities of Mark Noble in there, who's who works very well. And, and like I say, Lingard and. Uh, and Mikel Antonio have, have really uh, combined very, very well. But on the sides, Fornals, who's, who, who's a talent, along with Bourne, who's done great since he's come in for the championship. Then you can see throughout the team, they're uh, the team that play very well and uh, they've been consistent. So, uh, so yeah, it's 
it's not so much as a surprise because of David's qualities as a manager and the players that they have. But of course, maybe from, from people outside of the game, they'd maybe see it as a surprise. Now, the first fixture, but he hasn't scored in the last nine. What do you think he needs to get back on the score sheet this weekend? Listen, the team's still been winning. I think that uh, it's just a mixture of everything. I think what's most important is that, uh, you know, for Jamie, like I've always said to all the strikers, you've got to continue to work, you've got to continue to make runs. And sometimes you just need that little bit of luck. What, what he's done, obviously, a lot more in this last period where he's he's created a number of opportunities for us. And, and we know his threat. We know he can score at any time. It's just been really unfortunate between keepers making incredible saves, blocks on the line. Um, and like I say, some chances that he would maybe have put away. But that's that's natural. But what never stops for, for Jamie is he's always going to be there. And he's such a threat. You know, his sharpness, his speed... And uh, yeah, he's, he's a very important player for us. Last one for me, Brendan. Is a full chance for a successful season for you? For us to, to find success would be if we could uh, arrive in European football again for the second year uh, in a row. That would be great success for us. Of course, we want to arrive in, in the Champions League. That's what every team you want to arrive and finish is in the highest positions that you can. So, uh, but for us, once the 30th game is done, if we're in European football, that'll be that'll be success for us as a club. But we're going to fight to finish as high as we can. We have a semi-final uh, of the cup. Can we arrive into the final when that comes? And uh, yeah, that would uh, that would define a really really good season for us. So, uh, but what's most important is the 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 constant progression. I can see that this season, and um, yeah. And then we can put that to bed. There's so much to fight for still and so many points and and, and twists and turns, I'm sure. So, uh, but, but we're really looking forward to the end. Good luck for Sunday. Oh, Victor, that was Brendan Rogers. You can't take it away from him. He has done so much from a player he calls Kells, our very own Kelechi Hienacho. He has done very well for him. But he was asked the question, Kelechi signed a new contract and they're asking, is it because Jimmy Vardy isn't doing so well anymore. He hasn't scored in nine matches in all competitions. Might this be a, a, a gradual replacement for Vardy in Ian Acho? Yeah, but um, Ian Acho obviously had so much promise from his under 17 days up until his time at Manchester City and now he's little by little you know, coming to that level of a top striker of international repute. However, I do not think so. I don't think he's a long-term replacement for um, uh, Jamie Vardy. Jimmy Vardy seems to have defied all odds. You know, his, if you look at his career throughout his start from playing non-English football to becoming a Premier League champion and winning the Golden Boots last season. But I don't think Hian Acho is his long-term replacement. I think Hian Acho is just a good buffer. He's a good you know, second striker that will be a deputy. Vardy will, will still be the main guy at, at Leicester City. He's still the main number nine. He's not, he's not a replacement. Every striker goes through that phase in their career whereby they have a dry spell. Trust me, Vardy still looks very sharp. His movement is fantastic. His pace is still there. His finishing is on point. Yana Cho, as good as he is at the moment, is not a replacement for Jimmy Vardy. So sorry to disappoint my Nigerian football fans, but I don't think he's replacing Jimmy Vardy anytime soon. Uh, well, well, I'm the presenter here. I would have agreed with you, but I can't. It's not my job to do that. But uh, okay. Now, um, before I, 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 I didn't mention that on the show before we, we, when we started. Um, may the soul of Prince Philip rest in perfect peace. Um, Prince Philip um, died um, yesterday, aged 99. Now, what Prince, most people don't know about Prince Philip is that um, Prince Philip was the FA chairman in England at a point. In fact, it was the FA chairman going towards when England won the World Cup in 1966. Most people didn't know that. So he actually escorted his wife, Queen Elizabeth, to actually lift the trophy for England in 66 as the FA chairman in England. So we pray his soul rests in perfect peace. Now, every match in England this weekend till Monday, they will all wear dark armbands and um, a minute's silence before every match in the English Premier League. And of course, um, Victor, we all know that um, his children, a whole lot of his um, Prince Charles children, that is Prince Charles Jr. now, most of them who actually follow football or soccer in America, 
actually support Aston Villa. Very famous picture of uh, the late Duke of Edinburgh, of course, late Prince Philip, which is um, he showing his affiliation to English football. But one is, I think it was the FA Cup final. I can't remember the year. Obviously, I wasn't born. Uh, but it was an FA Cup final, and he was shaking the hands of uh, the Villa players, I, I think. So, um, yeah, many, many younger generations might not really know who Prince Philip is, obviously, because he has been around for so long. He's almost a century old. But his contribution to not just sports, but humanity as a whole cannot be understated. It's not many people, in fact, there was a statement on, uh, recently, they already said that he is the most popular husband in the world. Not many men can handle the responsibility of being the husband of the Queen of England. And of course, we all know that Queen Elizabeth has had such a very long reign. So he has been fantastic, been a wonderful support for her, both emotionally and in other areas of her life, and also been a fantastic ambassador for football. You mentioned he was the FA chairman or acting FA chairman during the most glorious year or moment of English football, which is the 1966 World Cup tournament, which they won. And to this day, even you agree with me as a, as a sports fan and sports lover, the English football fans don't keep quiet about that historic event. So he tells you, this tells you how much he has impacted, not just the royal family or the Commonwealth or the world in general, but the world of sports has had a massive, you know, influence from the late uh, Duke of Edinburgh. So may so, of course, rest in peace. Now, Victor, um, I was reading something this morning um, from a husband's perspective now. Um, somebody described um, the Duke of Edinburgh as um, the perfect husband, the husband any woman would want to have. Because being the husband of a queen of England, with all their tradition, he was extensively patient, didn't talk too much, wasn't always in the media for all the wrong reasons. And people say the Duke of Edinburgh is um, the husband any woman would want to marry for her daughter. <laughs> Well, um, I, can't, I can't really say because, number one, I'm not married, so I don't know what a perfect husband is. Uh, <laughs> even I get married, I'm not married. You probably should say that. But like I said earlier, I know it's not... Look, listen, the thing that, if you read his history, you realize that he actually comes from royalty as, as well. Yes, yeah, yes. His father, he found, exactly. So he, I'm pretty sure he was used to that world, in my own opinion. But like you mentioned, it's not easy being the husband of the queen of England. I jokingly call her the queen of the world because she's the most popular queen in the world. No, yeah. I mean, it doesn't get bigger than Queen Elizabeth, you know. So he, he did well in his role as a husband. But at the same time, many people will tell you that he had a great sense of humor whereby he made his wife, the queen of England, laugh, which is no easy feat. So to that credit or to that note, I would say maybe he might be the perfect husband, but I can't say. When I get married, I would uh, you know. a very wonderful experience. Manchester <laughs> City manager Pep Guardiola on Friday said he was overwhelmed after receiving effusive praise from his Leeds United counterpart, Marcello Bielsa, ahead of the Premier League clash on Saturday. Now, Argentine Bielsa, who steered Leeds back to the top flight after a 16-year absence this season, described Guardiola as a magical man and said he had given up trying to emulate the Spanish coach's style of play. Guardiola, who previously hailed Bielsa as one of the most important influences on his trophy-legged managerial career, was quick to return the compliments. Guardiola, whose side need a maximum of 11 points from the remaining seven games to seal the title, expects another stern challenge on Saturday. Guardiola also hailed midfielder Kevin De Bruyne and said the Belgian's decision to sign a contract extension was a testament to the environment the club had put in place. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I feel weird. Uh, uh, he's a huge competitor, so uh, I'm not going to try to to be weak after this works uh, because if that. Uh, they they can do whatever they want. Uh, I'm overwhelmed, so I know because he's the most honest person. Uh, when I was able to to speak with him, uh, I'm pretty sure what he says is what he believes. Uh, he doesn't say anything or do anything for for you know for the media for repercussion for himself. Uh, that's why I'm overwhelmed because uh, everybody knows the admiration, the respect, the way he helped me in my beginnings and always will be there in my heart. And that's why always I am 
uh, wow, uh, always I feel I don't deserve it. Uh, uh, because of course, if there is one person he can search or find the secrets or uh, the way we wanna do, the way we wanna play is him. And I know how tough will be tomorrow at 12.30. And, um, but hopefully we are prepared to compete because a part of this, we are three games away to be champion. And, uh, and tomorrow have another opportunity to, to make uh, a bigger step. And, and this is the reason why. I'm looking for the game, of course. The players know because we faced them there in the first leg and how difficult it was. And tomorrow will not be an exception. And the quality of the manager and the backroom staff showing the position in the table. So being promoted last season already safe with, I think, 42 points and uh, still seven games left. And uh, they made incredible well all the season. I can talk for myself, you know, all of you, the opinion, that's why I'm here five years and there will be two more in principle if, if the situation is going well. So, yeah, the club help us and, and I'm glad that the, the players, important players like Kevin, like can have all the wall in his hands and all the clubs will be delighted to have him. So we decide to continue with us. It's a, I think it's a big compliment for all Manchester City. Of course, um, Victor, that was Pep Guardiola going up against Marcello Bielsa, 12.30 this, today. Of course, after this program, you get ready for that match. And of course, he says, I can never underestimate Marcello Bielsa. And of course, um, Leeds have actually stunned the press in England this season. However, Man City Guardiola is an old school coach. He plays mind games. Everybody's shouting, Man City, no new players, no new this. Kunaguero is going. Only you see, but he still does well in every game. He comes against Leeds at 12.30 today. What do we expect? Well, credit to uh, Pep. Like you mentioned, he is part of that. Is I think it's the last time breed of managers have played that psychological game. You had the likes of Ferguson, uh, you know, Benitez and co, you know, the great, uh, the late great uh, Brian Clough. They all played this massive psychological game. But he's the last breed of that. Um, credit to Pep Guardiola. Like we mentioned with Liverpool and the fans and the media giving excuses, Man City had injuries. KDB was out. Kevin De Bruyne was out for the majority of this season. Same with Aguero. Not a known number nine, but he made it work. So I give credit to Pep that he, in a very difficult season and difficult period in humanity with the COVID-19, fans not in the stadium, and all that, he still was able to create a title-winning team. And you have to give him credit for that. As for his praise and admiration for Bielsa, he has had this since his days in Spain with Barcelona. And of course, when uh, Bielsa was the coach of Atletico Bilbao, they've always been, have had great you know, respect for each other. But I think that it's time to you know, drop all that and let's have a wonderful game of football. I can assure you one thing, Wally, that this is going to be a very, very entertaining game of football. It will not be a nil-nil draw. That is for sure, because both managers have their style of play. They are very, very stubborn with their style of play. They won't change their tactics. It is all out attacking football. Expect an entertaining, high-scoring game. I'm going to go with a 4-2 victory for Man City. Lots and lots of oh, goals. chances. Wow, but I remember, like you said earlier, old-school coaches, Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho. I remember when Man City played Man U some seasons ago. And um, Sokshaw was all over the place. Yes, he's got Gabriel Jesus. He's got Sergio Kuna, Guerrero. And they're going to take Man City, Man U apart. And Man U was waiting for them. And Guardiola came to the game and left Jesus on the bench. He left Kuna, Guerrero on the bench. And made Kevin De Bruyne a dubbing dummy nine. And they took Man U to the cleaners. Who does that? Only Guardiola does that. He made De Bruyne a midfielder, a dummy nine, a top striker on the day. Left his two strikers on the bench. And they made mincemeat of Man U that day. Mincemeat. I agree with you 110% because the reality of the matter is that Pep has proved. Because, you know, when he was at Barca, many of us, even myself included, I was like, yeah, you have Messi, you have Iniesta, you have Xavi. Why would you win everything in football? But I think he has proven his mettle. Going to Bayern in Germany, dominating in German football, people also said, well, there's only two teams in Germany, Dortmund and Bayern. Then he came to England and I was like, there is no way he's going to succeed in England. There is no way. He came to England, restructured Man City. 
Don't forget, at the time when he came to England, uh, the likes of Toure and Co were the top dogs in Man City. Yeah. He came, we sent Toure and restructured what Manchester City is all about. Their tactics, their style of play changed everything, made Sterling the player he is today. And I agree with you, Pep is the last of a dying breed of coaches who have that old school mentality that makes press conferences exciting. Imagine the world of football if we didn't have a Jose Mourinho or a Alex Ferguson or a Benitez. Coaches that have made you want to, even here in, back home in Nigeria, we had the likes of the, uh, the late uh, Stephen Keshi. He was a very entertaining coach with his press conferences. So True that. We don't have any more, but kudos to Pep. He has done well for, for Man City and he will go down as the best, one of the best coaches ever. He will, top, top three coaches of all time, he will go down. Okay, now let's, let's go to this. For those of you out there who don't understand how important this is, I'm, I'll explain it to you now. This is the biggest thing, biggest club football match out of Europe. I'll explain to you why. There's a place in Spain called Catalonia. They want a republic of their own. They want to leave Spain and get a republic of their own. And Spain say no. Now, the Barcelona team call themselves the Catalans because they're from Catalonia. They want to break away. And Real Madrid are in Spain who are saying, no, we are going to stay as one Spain. So this match sometimes goes beyond football. It's actually more political than football. The Catalonians who want to break away from Spain, taking, over, taking on Spain. And so Real Madrid, it's more like bragging rights. It's more like elbow room. You can't win us. You can't go away from Spain. And Catalonia, whenever they win, they're like, okay, good. It's a gradual process. We win you guys today will win in the boardroom eventually too. But Zidane says, he hopes Saturday's El Clasico, that's what it's called, isn't Lionel Messi's last. The Real Madrid boss said the Argentine is good for La Liga. I want him to stay at Barca for the foreseeable future. And the French man was once again asked about rumors, linking La Blancos with Paris Saint-Germain star Kylian Mbappe, with Zidane again rebuffing the line of questioning. Real and Barca meet at the Estadio Alfredo Di Stefano Stadium on Saturday as they look to pile on the pressure on league leaders Atletico Madrid, who are one point clear of Barca and three clear of neighbors Real. Victor El Clasico. Well, uh, be before I get into Clasico proper, because, I mean, that even has, its, we should have a special for that alone. We exactly. Have a special one hour for the El Clasico. Before I get into that, let me just quickly talk about the comments of Zidane. Let me address that for a minute. I don't, I, listen, I, I like how coaches go through media training so they don't know how to speak to the media, but sometimes I prefer when coaches are very honest. There is no football coach in the world that will tell you He's coaching in the same league with Lionel Messi and he'll be happy that Messi doesn't want to leave that league. How can you tell me he's happy that Messi will want to... No. I think he deep down inside, he wants Messi to go so he will have a chance to win more trophies with Real Madrid. But that aside, the El Clasico is, like you mentioned, the biggest football event by the World Cup. In terms of uh, a rivalry, we have never seen anything like it before. Most likely, we will not see anything like it afterwards if that will be the case. Um, these are two teams, two juggernauts of European football that have won it all. They have won everything there is to win in, in, in club football, and they still go at it with the same hunger and drive. Yes, the box office appeal might not be there because a certain Ronaldo is no longer in Real Madrid, but you cannot deny the gravity. Like you mentioned, it's almost like a political statement. The Madrid team from the capital of Spain and the team from Catalonia, Barcelona. So it's, it's quite incredible when these two teams go head to head. Um, a bit of fun fact, uh, the first meeting between these two teams was actually a 3-1 victory for Barcelona. And the last meeting was a 3-1 victory for Real Madrid. So that is just some crazy facts amongst many other thousand crazy facts about this fantastic uh, fixture. I am looking forward to it tonight. It is going to be a fun storm. I'm looking forward to it tonight, yeah. Let me ask a question now. We're looking at a Real Madrid side who are, de who are depending on the pace of Vinicius Jr., who are depending on the assassin um, um, thing of um, Karim Benzema, who are depending on Sergio Ramos if he is back. But we're looking at a Barcelona who don't have it, they don't have the Ansu Fati young man back yet. We are just looking at a Messi who has not, is not on full throttle at this point. And we're looking at a, both teams are not doing very, very well at this point, if you ask me. But the El Clasico is always a different ball game. Are we going to see a different Barca, a different Real today? In all honesty, like I mentioned before, the box office appeal of the El Clasico has, you know, waned a bit over the last few years. But 
uh, what we can all agree as football fans and football analysts and individuals that love the game of football is that both teams are in a need of some sort of restructuring in terms of rebuilding. Uh, I, I want to have a Real Madrid that had that all-star appeal it had in the early 2000s to the mid-2000s when the, the, the two Ronaldos were there, Zidane was there as a player, Figo, Kaká. I mean, I want, I want that kind of appeal. I also want to have a Barcelona team that also had great players like Ronaldinho, Eto, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Thierry Henry, you know, Messi himself, uh, Griezmann, who is now part of the team now. I want that same feel because it, it adds to the spectacle. But now Griezmann hasn't performed to the level we thought he would. Messi, people say he's not a full throttle. I think he is just declining. Age is just coming and he's knocking on the door right now. Dembele really hasn't fired on all cylinders. The team is just trying to find his feet. Same with the, with the Madrid team. Vinicius Jr. is not a name you put on post up on, on the billboard and say, hey, look out for him. He's a good young player, but he's not that level yet. Karim Benzema needed a Ronaldo to shine or a Bill to shine with. None of that is with him. So both teams need to revamp their, their marketability in terms of getting marquee signings into the club. So with that being said, based on current form this season, like I predicted on my personal show, I said that it is going to be a draw because both teams just lack that cutting edge. Will there be goals? Yes, there will be goals. Will there be you know, defensive errors? Yes, there will be, especially for Real Madrid because they're missing Varane who tested positive for COVID-19 and Sergio Ramos who is also a doubt. So there might be one or two errors leading to goals, but it's going to be a draw, most likely a one-one draw. If there will be lots of goals, it's be a two-two draw, in my opinion. If I was to so go with, not going to be, if I was yeah. to go with your prediction now, um, if you are predicting a draw, whether it's a high-scoring draw or a low-scoring draw, it's because you are expecting both teams to be very careful. No, it's not because they are going to be very careful. To be honest with you, when, I mean, minus the midweek performances or performance of Real Madrid. Watch the La Liga this season. Both teams have just, they just get over the line. They haven't been convincing in their victories. Just one or two matches that they win, like maybe four or five or seven nil. But Madrid and Barca this season haven't played the, with the level of confidence and bravado that we've known over the years. I mean, in Spain, they, they always beat every other person apart from when they play each other. But this season, it has been a struggle to get over the line. I mean, Madrid had to score a late last-minute winner last week. I'm sorry, last match day before they could win their match. So both teams have not really played well, in my opinion. It's not because, you know, they're going to be cagey. It's because they haven't just been playing well, honestly. Okay, now Kenya Sports Ministry kicked off a nationwide COVID-19 vaccination program that saw about 500 sportsmen and women receive the AstraZeneca jab. The drive will see 3,500 athletes and stakeholders inoculated over a six-day period, with Minister of Sport Amina Muhammad saying that the priority will be given to athletes, coaches and athlete handlers heading to Tokyo for the rescheduled Olympic Games set to begin on July 23rd. While those who got jabbed expressed their satisfaction, it remains to be seen whether elite track and field athletes will join the vaccination drive in the coming days. Uh, the job was painless and I'm quite glad we're going, we're going through this initiative to get everyone uh, past this uh, pandemic as soon as possible because we need the world to go back to normal. We've received the job here at Kasarani Stadium. Uh, I would like to thank the government and the Ministry of Health for the preparations and organizations that they brought the vaccine here. It was easily accessible for us as a sport, sports people. For us, it's, it's just at the level of comfort, you know, that uh, no Kenyan Olympian will go there, be tested and found to be positive, yeah? So, so for us, just that level of comfort to show that as a country, we're actually at the forefront of fighting the, the disease, as we have done as all this wonderful, you know, uh, you know, people have done. So, uh, some athletes we can fear, you know, but my encouragement, you cannot fear. This is protection for yourself, you know. So please come join vaccine. It is fine. It is okay. I guess some good news there. Of course, some Kenyan athletes to the Tokyo Olympics have all taken their vaccines and they're all cool. And the, the head of the 
contingent says, we're happy that by the time we get there to Tokyo, none of us will be tested positive for COVID-19. That's the good news I have, Victor. That's the good news I have. The good news is that Kenya is, is well, working beyond time before July 23rd to get all the athletes vaccinated. I think that's good for, 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 Afri for Africa and, of course, for Kenya before the Olympics. What is, what is the bad news? You want to hear the bad news first? Let me, hear the news, uh. <laughs> let, me say, let, let me say the bad news first. Okay. The United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee will help athletes find a COVID-19 vaccine, but will not require them to get a shot to compete at the Tokyo Summer Games, CEO Sarah Hirschland said. Now, with U.S. President Joe Biden directing states to widen vaccine eligibility, to people 18 or older by April 19th, most athletes will have access to a COVID-19 shot long before the July 23rd opening of the Tokyo Olympics, but the US OPC will not mandate one. Now, instead, the US OPC said it would provide logistical support, connecting athletes and other personnel with places who can get the vaccine. Carlin Isles, a former collegiate American football player and track athlete turned rugby standout, said that although after initial reluctance, he planned to get the vaccine. We are not tracking, we are not mandating. I think you've heard us say before, we will not mandate the vaccine either for uh, Team USA athletes nor for uh, any other members of the delegation, but we are encouraging it and we absolutely are facilitating uh, that access to, to try to help connect folks with either local public health or local hospital systems, um, local providers, so that wherever they are training around the country, um, they have an easy path to, to get vaccinated. And we know many of our athletes and many of our staff have already been vaccinated um, because they've chosen to offer that information. But it's not something that we'll track and it's not something that we'll mandate. But I think our hosts in Japan are very cautious, rightfully so. Uh, if you look at, while well, they have seen some increases in their numbers, their numbers are actually much better than many, many other nations as well. So I think this really is going to be a situation where we have to operate in something of a bubble, and I think that is the plan. Uh, I think that at this point in time, we do not see anything that says that, that there's any reason to think that we cannot keep going forward, but we have to be realistic and keep looking at the science, looking at the situation on the ground. I can tell you that our athletes are trying very hard not to focus on the possibility of, of any changes in the plan. They are absolutely 100% focused on preparation for games that should, should happen and that they believe will happen and that we hope will happen. Um, we're realists. We understand that the health situation in the world is not in anyone's control, really. But uh, at this point in time, we still believe that this can be responsibly and safely accomplished. Now, Victor, that was the sad news. The sad news is that in the U.S., um, the contingent, the Olympic contingent, say, listen, some are saying, I don't want AstraZeneca. Some are saying, I want this one. I don't want that one. Some are saying, I don't want vaccine at all. And Tokyo Olympic organizers say, listen, if you don't take any vaccine, you are, accept, you are not entering Tokyo. So some are saying, I might not even go for the Olympics at all. So I think there's a lot of problems with the U.S. Olympic team saying, I don't want this particular vaccine. I want this one. I don't want at all. There might be a large amount of the U.S. team saying we are not going to Tokyo at the end of the day. That's the sad news. Well, it is sad, but let me go back to the good news, which was the Kenya. fact that most athletes are being, you know, given the vaccine for this uh, virus that has affected us all. Now, that's good news from the path of Africa, uh, because usually we have a very, very bad history and reputation for not preparing well for international competition. True that's that, true that. For. So uh, this is a very big step forward for uh, the African sports scene image. Uh, now to address the other, the other news, which is seemingly not so happy, the reality of the matter is that basically it's actually also for the Paralympic Games, because you, as you know, the, the same year and the same, in the same uh, you know, yeah. city, after the Olympic Games, we have the Paralympic Games. Now for, the, for Team USA, 
the reality of the matter is that it's not just only what is affecting individuals in sports. It's more of a global thing with people's skepticism towards the vaccine. Some are saying it is good. Some are saying it's not good. People have their own opinion. There are many conspiracy theories, right, left, and center. But what I can tell any professional athlete in sports is you have to do what you need to do to compete at the highest level of whatever sports you're involved in. No doubt. And the Olympic Games is the biggest... Okay, I think I lost him there. Okay, um, thank you very much, Victor Geoffrey, for joining us on the show this morning. Join us same time, same show next week for Plus Sports Special on Plus TV Africa. My name is Wally Scott. Like I always advise you at the end of every show, if not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports. <laughs>